Good morning. Happy Father's Day. In honor of this momentous occasion, I wore pants and a collared shirt. Because dads teach that we should all grow up eventually. <laughs> so, guys, I was born at St. Mary's Hospital in San Francisco. And in my 46 years, the 41 miles between... St. Mary's Hospital and Trinity Church of Sunnyvale has been home. Now, I went to college in Chicago for a few years and even served a quick uh, short-term missionary up in northern Alaska, but this has been home. I've grown roots and they're deep, deep. But as you may know, as Joel pointed out, my family and I are being transplanted just a little bit further than 41 miles. Uh, in fact, from Trinity Church in Sunnyvale to First Baptist Church in Centerville, Iowa, it is 1,860 miles door to door. A little further than that 41 miles. <laughs> it's hard to leave a place that's been all you've ever known. We know, my wife and I know for a fact that it's in fact God calling us to Centerville. Because believe me, that was not our first choice. Maui. <laughs> Boulder, Colorado, something like that, but Centerville, Iowa. <laughs> but yet still, we are trusting that it is God, and in that trust, it's been a little scary. <laughs> I'm sure you guys can imagine. You know, it's hard to leave a place with roots. It's a little bit scary moving into the unknown. And interestingly, throughout this whole process, there have been some things creep up, right? Natural things worries about the outcome, fears of the unknown, concerns around provision or our family's proximity to one another have all kind of crept up as these like fears in the back of our minds, almost, almost stopping us in our tracks, being obstacles, even roadblocks at times in moving forward and trusting God with this call, which is why I couldn't in good conscience leave Trinity and not give you this message. Watch out for roadblocks. Now, a roadblock traditionally, you guys know, is something that's designed to thwart you from moving forward. It's, it's to redirect your path, right? But in the context of this message, we're going to go a little bit different. A roadblock is something designed to impact or thwart our relationship with God or re redirect us from his path for our lives. Now, John 10, 10 talks a little bit about this. It says the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. This is Jesus talking. The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So it's pretty low hanging fruit. We know two things right off the bat from this. You don't have to dig too much into it. There's an adversary with bad intentions. And then there's Jesus, who wants to bring us life to the full. So keep that in the back of your mind as we dig in. We're going to jump into John 14 here in a second. Now, <clears throat> give you a little context. Jesus had just had the Last Supper with his disciples, and he had dismissed Judas to go do what he must. And he's now discussing what is to transpire next, okay? He's leaving. He's leaving them. And he gives them this piece he's trying to tell them hey i'm going to comfort you guys don't worry i'm going ahead of you i'm going to prepare a place for you but john 14 verse 4 he says you know the way to the place where i am going and thomas asks kind of a logical question he says lord we don't know where you're going so how can we know the way Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, here's the thing with this. There's, there's a message here. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm the way. I'm the fulfillment of the law. I am the way to the Father. I am the truth. 
meaning I am the word become flesh. I am the life, as in I am the model in how you are to live, how we are to live and commune with the Father. Jesus walked us through this. So, of course, back to that John 10, 10 idea, these are the very things that our adversary, the devil, would be after, right? Right. He wants nothing more than to put up a roadblock or redirect us from this way, truth, and life. To steal from us our hope and joy and direct us toward things that will lead to the death or destruction of our relationship with Jesus. That is a roadblock. Now keep in mind, y'all, this is not a situation of a little devil on your shoulder whispering in each of your ears. Okay? I just want to be clear about one thing. The enemy is active, but he is not God's counterpart. He is not God's equal. He is a created being. Straight up, I just want to be clear. He is a created being. Okay? He's not omnipresent like God. He can't be in all places at once. So he's not whispering, you know, sweet nothings in your ears, trying to thwart you and present roadblocks. But he has been active for a very long time. And he does have a lot of his little minions, not the little yellow guys, (laughs) causing mischief. Although I like to think of the little yellow guys as the demons, because that just makes me laugh at them even more. Okay, but... But he can't be in all places at once. In fact, all he really has is manipulation tactics. He doesn't have any real power. He's just the same manipulative little snake that he was back in the garden. That's all he's got. He preys on our perceptions and he beckons us to redirect our path. He's trying to help us to find a way, a way from the way. But he doesn't have any real power to change our faith. Oh, but he's aware you do. He's aware we do. See, with free will, each of us has a choice on what to believe and what to do. So the enemy presents us with an alternative choice. And often, it seems like the easier path. So again, back to John 10.10, Jesus is warning us. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But do not miss his proclamation. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now in John 14, Jesus sheds some light on what this life to the full looks like. John 14, Jesus says, 14, 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. Keep my commands. Then in 14, 21, he gives you the why. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me, don't miss this, will be loved by my father. And I, too, will love them and show myself to them. There's your why. Then John 14, 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. See, the life to the full that Jesus mentions in John 10, 10 And the way, the truth, and the life Jesus mentions in John 14 is outlined here. They are the same life. Both are referring to a restored and intimate relationship with God by way of Jesus. That fatherly relationship where he gets good gifts and he bestows and he dies for us and he brings about reconciliation. Life to the full. Guys, I hate to break it to you. It's not the prosperity gospel. It's the get to gospel. We get to have, we get to have an intimate relationship with God. God created us to have a relationship with us in our beginning in the garden. This was the way God walked among them in the garden and spoke to them. Adam and Eve heard God walking in the garden. They spoke with God and then the fall happened. And even then, though, even then, God wanted that intimate relationship. He could have just wiped this out and started again. But instead, he provided a way out. When he talked to the enemy and he told him, 
point blank, hey, there's a man of promise coming from this woman's line, and he's going to smash your head. That's Genesis 3.15. He will bite your heel, meaning the enemy will bite at Jesus' heel. He'll try to harm him, but Jesus is going to stomp his head. The end. Game over. Letting the enemy know who's really victorious and who's in charge here. But all the way back in Genesis 3, God's promising that there is a redemption, that there is a way out, that he loves us so much, that he wants this relationship with us so much that he was already thinking of everything. He thought ahead. Even the Ten Commandments, which I know, it's the law. It's the rules. Right? People think of those, they don't think loving. <laughs> they think rule book. But in writing this, I started to think of the Ten Commandments a little bit different. It's kind of a love letter, to be honest. Think about this for a minute. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Second commandment, don't look at any other pictures of any other gods either. Husbands, does that sound like your wives? <laughs> no, but seriously, I want to be clear about this. That is intimate language. None before me. Nobody between us. It's just you and me like this. That, that's intimate relationship. The all-powerful creator of the universe is a relational God, and he wants a relationship with us. That is good news. Not just any relationship, but a relationship with nothing in between. No other gods, no other images. So similar to marriage, kind of made me uncomfortable. Because I was like, oh, I always looked at this as like rules. But he doesn't want anything driving a wedge between us. In fact, he gave us the law, I believe, to protect us from ourselves. To protect us and warn us that, hey, <laughs> this world is filled with things that are going to take you out. That are designed to take you out. Things, well, not designed for. He designed them for something else. The enemy's going to try and manipulate them into something that will take you out. But things that will get in the way in between the relationship that we're supposed to have. The law was kind of like God's own way of saying, watch out for roadblocks. Although, don't get it twisted, that's my words, God. God. Just like the expectations of the law, just like Jesus said in John 14, keep my commands and obey my teachings. There's a theme here of obedience and obedience-based action. It's a call to an active choice. A choice on our part to live in a relationship without roadblocks, without idols, without anything in our way, to let it rip. <laughs> Please understand, though, this is not a salvific statement, okay? This is not, hey, do these works and then you'll be saved. No, no. We do not have to receive Jesus. We do not have to be reconciled with God. We do not have to live a life redeemed. We get to. The life of obedience is not a prerequisite to salvation. It is a privilege of the saved. But don't be deceived. God is asking nothing short of our total trust in him. So that we can have absolute obedience when he calls. I'm going to say that again. Total trust in him. So that... When he calls, we can have absolute obedience. This is a posture of yes, as I call it. And Jesus understood it well. When he prayed at the garden, he asked, God, take this cup from me, but your will be done. <clears throat> now, he also explained to would-be followers that would come and try to talk to him and be like, I want to follow you. What's the way? What's the way to the kingdom of heaven? How do I get saved? Jesus didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't. He knew what the cost was. He knew what these folks were really asking. So I'm going to paraphrase a couple of things for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Luke 9, Jesus replies to a handful of men who said they wanted to follow him. One, he says, listen to these statements. Let the dead bury the dead. What? That seems harsh. The son of man has no place to lay his head. 
Meaning, following me might be uncomfortable. You may not even have a home. Or Matthew 19, sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And scripture's clear. He says that the man was sad because he had much wealth and he walked away. Now, I don't know all the outcomes of all of these men that that came to Jesus, and I know that these sound harsh, but y'all, please don't leave here thinking that Jesus was harsh and didn't want these people to follow him. He didn't tell them to leave. I want to point that out. You notice he didn't say, get away from me. He told them what was in their way. He told them their one thing that was in their way. They made their choice. You notice that? Now, keep in mind, y'all, these references, they get manipulated a little bit sometimes. They are not intended to be universal. Okay? So I don't want y'all squirming in your seats. Like, I got to be homeless. I got to sell everything I own. I got to give it to the poor. There's something to be said for these things, but... But these are contextual statements, okay? He was making these statements to these men in context, to their issue, their one thing. He was aware of their roadblocks. Perhaps that was the one and only thing that was preventing them from that life that was available to them. If they would just give Jesus his yes. And I think if we all really got honest and we look deep, we all probably have one thing. More than one, maybe. That thing that if really hard pressed might make us hesitate just enough in giving our wholehearted yes. I think if I really wanted to make people uncomfortable, I could start pushing, but I'm not going to do that to you today. (laughs) Thank you. Got to thank you from the front. I know I've had that wrestle. I've wrestled with God of all the logical reasons that I shouldn't follow him into this fray. Right? Like, God, Iowa? Man, I, my wife won't do good in the cold. I, I think Maui sounds better. Maui's better. <clears throat> but I am curious. What are your roadblocks? Is there something that if really hard pressed, if the Holy Spirit started to nudge you, that you'd be so uncomfortable with that you'd hesitate? Or maybe walk away? How far is too far? And it may not be that first question. Just be clear here, okay? Some of y'all, we got missions trips coming up. Who's going to Uganda? Some of y'all are getting squirmy. There's a couple of you, though. Right? We got Uganda coming. We got a couple others coming. Here's the thing, though. If I said, who wants to go on a short-term mission trip? I might be able to encourage you and get you to go. Who wants to sell their house and go on mission field forever? Well, I watch like six people just go, like I did something bad in their face. Stink faced me. <laughs> it's true. I won't, I won't pick on people, but there are a few of y'all in this section that were like. <clears throat> it's important that we prayerfully search these things out. I'm not shaming you. I have my things, okay? I have them. I'm, this is not a pointing at you thing. This is a all of us thing. It's important that we prayerfully search these things out to ask, are there things? Are there things that are going to get in the way? Now, oftentimes, there are clues in our day-to-day lives, even, you know, maybe it's our busyness, right? We're too busy to serve, or we're striving to provide and earn that one thing, or just put a little bit more into retirement, or pay off that house, or get that Tesla, or whatever it is. Maybe it's just we're tired. I mean, this is the Bay Area. We put in more man hours on the job than anywhere else in the country. We're beat. We get home. Maybe we just want to sit on the couch and turn on the TV. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Right. Right. Those things aren't sins, okay? Don't. Those aren't sins. I like to watch alone with my family just as much as the next guy. But I'll tell you, they become issues when they become roadblocks to our yes. If they are in the way to our willingness to serve, if they are in the way to our willingness to obey God's commands, we start getting in trouble. Or maybe it's people. Maybe it's certain situations or certain people that really push back. Right now, I have a confession to make. It's recent. I've had issues with, with 
the provision for our family, right? Like we all know this is a normal thing. But I went to a wedding yesterday. I got to officiate my niece's wedding. And I hope she's not listening online, but there were some folks there, y'all, that I had a hard time not judging. I mean, they were drunk, filthy, falling over drunk before they even got to the podium. Not my, not my niece and her groom, but like some of the groomsmen walked up like this. I'm ready. Shirts tucked into their belt, flies held up with a paper clip. It just a mess, right? And I'm looking at these people and I'm judging them instead of loving them. Roadblock. Roadblock. And I didn't, you know, it's sad. My brother's here and, and his wife's here and we came out. It's his daughter that got married. And I didn't even, I'm a pastor. I should know better, but I didn't even feel it hit me until the end. And we were driving away and I was like, I could have been a better witness. I could have loved those people so much better. There could have been a person of peace there just waiting to hear from me. So there's roadblocks. Sometimes it's how people look. Maybe it's how they smell, right? Maybe it's financial, like, hey, don't mess with my livelihood or my income. Don't you touch my wallet. Maybe it's ministering to those in your community who are addicted or peddling drugs. Or maybe it's that political party or group of people that are so different from you and your ideals that you would just rather not talk to them at all. Is it loving that neighbor that's kind of on your last nerve? Maybe it's comfort, like giving up your free time and putting less into retirement and more into kingdom uses. Are there things in your life that are shifting your posture from yes? Are you getting uncomfortable yet? Now, perhaps maybe even you've disqualified yourself because like me, you're like, I've done too much. I'm not the right person. Or maybe there's something you've done that you believe that you're incapable or unworthy for the assignment. In any of these, if any of these sound familiar to you, I want to encourage you with something I've personally come to realize and love the freedom of this sentence, okay? If God is engaging me to be a part of something that he wants to do, it's a blessing and a privilege. But the cost, the how, and the outcome are not for me. They're his. They're his. I've learned that God wants my yes. In fact, that's the only thing I can actually control is my posture of obedience, my posture of yes to him. God's job is the outcome. And whew, that's a hard one. Because too often I try to control the outcome. And in doing that, I end up sitting on a throne that was not meant for me. And that's where God's been working on me a lot of late. Probably the most of all. So y'all know I have two amazing kids, McKenna, who's 23, and Grayson, who's 14, and many of the dads in the room can relate to this. God knows that for me, my one thing has always been them. I've spent their entire lives desperately trying to be a good dad and failing often, trying to be the provider, trying to be the protector. But y'all, often I have failed to allow God to do what God had to do with them in terms of them seeing him as their protector and their provider and their lover. Because I've been so bent on, I got to do it, I got to do it, I got to do it. And don't hear me, fathers, you guys know it is your role and it is your blessing to get to do those things. But man, it is God's. I can do all I want to do. It's not going to get to control them. And I have to tell you, I have come face to face with God in this argument a lot. Pastor Joel will tell you. I have sat in his office and wept. I could tell you. He'll tell you. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny. God's come to me and he said, Tony, I know that you know I love McKenna and Grayson. I know you know that. But see, actions are very different than knowledge. So do you trust me? See, my daughter, 
She's chosen to stay in California when we moved to Iowa. That's not shame on her. She's a grown woman. She's learning to live her life. I'm proud of her. But I've experienced God say, whew, I know, Tony, I know she's your baby girl. I'm going to keep it together, I swear. Whew. <clears throat> Do you trust that I will provide for her? Do you trust that I am her protector? Do you trust that if she chooses to stray away from me, just like you once did, Tony, that I will call to her heart, just like I called to hers, to yours, in a way unique just for her? Do you trust me with McKenna's outcome? Okay. See how I said it's the next level questions that get you? How about Grayson? Do you trust me with your one and only son? Act like God doesn't know what that's like. Do you trust me that in the calling of your family out to Iowa, that I'm calling Grayson out here just like I called you and Jen? That I've got something amazing for him that's just for him? Do you trust me to do that amazing thing in my way and in my timing? I gotta tell you, it is uncomfortable when God starts pointing out your roadblocks. My kids, see, they weren't given to me to be idols in the way of my relationship with God. They weren't, and they're not. But if I let them be, See, I've had the privilege and the blessing to get to love them and get to know God better by getting to be their dad. Any dad in this room can tell you they know and understand God better because they're a father. Amen, fathers? Amen. But the truth is, though, I've allowed my love for them at times to become an issue and at times even a reason to say no. It's been a wedge in my relationship with God. I have talked about going on missions. and I'm like, no, I'm not bringing my kids on the mission field. Thank God I've grown a little bit. We're supposed to be on the alert of these things. Now, this doesn't mean, by the way, that just because I've failed in these ways that now I have to give away my children. Come fight me. It's not going to happen. <laughs> this is just a call to kind of reorder our thoughts, to reorder my thoughts in, in my obedience, in our obedience. Reorder our thoughts and our obedience to put God first where he belongs. And to check our obedience to say yes to him, right? Now, I've always marveled. It's hot up here. I have always marveled at people in the Bible. And, and for that matter, people of great faith. I've heard some pretty cool stories here since being at Trinity of people of great faith who just give God their yes with vigor. Like God says, hey, do it. And they're like, okay. I've always taken, been taken aback by these people. Take Peter, for example. You just got to love Peter, all of his faults and his foibles and his issues. Man always seems to be tripping over his own tongue. I could relate. <laughs> but you know what's funny about Peter? If David is a God after man's own heart, Peter is a man after mine. He is human. <laughs> he's raw. He's full of passion and emotion, and he gets into it. And he's like, okay. He's actually got my favorite faith story probably in all of scripture. You guys know the one of him walking on water. I'm going to read part of it to you. Matthew 14, 23 through 27. I'm going to start there. It says, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. This is Jesus. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat carrying the disciples was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before the dawn, Jesus went out to him, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. <laughs> okay. Sure. sure. <laughs> now. They're a considerable distance from land. They're buffeted by the waves. It's dark. They say it's always darkest before the dawn. I don't know if that's true, but hey, it was right before dawn, so it must have been dark. I just want to point out something, though, okay? They're convinced this is a ghost. 
Y'all, it is more logical for these men to assume it was a ghost than to assume it was Jesus. Surely they've heard the tales of the sea or ghost stories in their lifetime, but nobody had walked on water until Jesus. <laughs> right? So it was logical for them to assume it was a ghost, but it was completely illogical, completely illogical to think, oh, sure, it's Jesus coming. Makes total sense. But then Matthew 14, 28. Ah, man, Peter is a lunatic, but I love him. He says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. What? Okay. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. But do you guys understand the ridiculousness of this request? Just a second ago, it was completely illogical to even assume it was Jesus. And now you want to, you thought it was a ghost and you want to walk to him? Now I'm making a stank face. What? What? I'm sorry. That is not my first question. Can I come? Nope. <laughs> that ain't it. I might, I might be like, how are you doing that? That might be my first question. That seems logical to me. Or maybe even more, more appropriate. Why are you able to do that? Because no human had ever done that before. So, okay, why are, why are you able? But can I come? That's not my brain. It blows my mind. And then 1429 is, Jesus says, come. And Peter gets down out of the boat and walks on the water toward Jesus. Peter walks on the water. That should be a ooh-ah moment. I think we look past it too often because everybody knows what happens next. <laughs> right? Peter sinks. He looks at the waves and the wind, and he's like, oh, save me, Jesus. And Jesus reaches down, and Peter's always marred by the words, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? But don't get stuck in the negative. Don't get stuck in the what happened then. Look at this for a second. Peter walked on water. And as far as I know, <laughs> y'all are messing with me as a youth pastor. You know I got jokes. <clears throat> as far as I know, he's the only one to have gotten to walk on water since. Peter was the only one, by the way, I want to point this out too. He's the only one in that boat with the faith to ask mm -hmm. to come out. He was the only one. The rest of the disciples were, I don't know what they were doing, but they weren't saying, can I come? They were probably like me. <laughs> they were probably like, uh, I'm not even sure he's really Jesus. Like even after the guy was like, after, after Jesus was like, hey, don't freak out. It's just me. It's paraphrasing. Just paraphrasing. But why did Peter have that faith? Why? Because any ideas? I could tell you. I, I, I have an opinion. Here's what I think. I can only assume this about Peter. I haven't talked to him yet. I hope to someday. That he had spent so much time with Jesus and he knew his character. He knew that he was good. He had seen him do countless amazing and miraculous things. And in that moment, the only thing that mattered to Peter was his proximity to Jesus. See, Peter had this faith and desire, in my opinion, this is what I think, okay, to ask because of that. He just wanted to be near Jesus. And because he had the faith to ask, when he got confirmation, that it was Jesus and he got approval to come, he went. Peter was like, forget the logic. Forget physics. That one's hard for me. I'll sink like a stone. Forget the fact that it's never been done before. 
Tell me to come and I'll come. That's faith I want. That is what life without roadblocks, without fears, with nothing in between you and Jesus, that's what that can look like. If we spend enough time with Jesus, if we get to know him, and I'm not saying you have to be saved and walking with Jesus for 40 years. I'm saying if we get into it, we get into his word, we start praying with him, you have an encounter with God and you see that he is good. Tell me to come and I'll come. That's what a life can look like. Now, I say can because sometimes we know we might be like the status quo on that boat and just keep our mouths shut. Or sometimes we'll look at the wind and the waves and we'll sink like Peter. But whatever the thing that makes you hesitate, I just want to encourage you guys, inspect that thing. Look at it. Dig into it. Don't be afraid of it. See how it fits in to this. See if it's from God. I mean, there's certain things that you're like, no, this is a no. Like, should I move to Maui? No, that was a firm no. (laughs) But if he wants you to do it, and if he calls you to go past that roadblock, this is my encouragement. And maybe you have to go past that very thing that you're concerned with. Maybe it's letting your daughter and your son grow up. Maybe it's Stepping out in faith into that mission field. Maybe it's talking to that stranger that smells a little funny. Whatever it is, take a deep breath. And with your eyes fixed on Jesus, just like Peter, take that step out of your boat. Will it be hard? Maybe. Will it even hurt sometimes? I can tell you it will. To follow Jesus? Yeah, sometimes. I don't want to sugarcoat it. I want to be like Jesus. I want to tell the truth. It's going to be hard at times. But will it be worth it every single moment? Maybe not in that moment. It might be like you're screaming with your hair on fire going down a roller coaster. But I promise after that ride, you're going to be like, that was awesome. (laughs) And what's funny about faith moments is once you do them, they're addicting and you're going to want to do them again. Free from roadblocks. That's the life. Free to experience what God has in store for us. Free to be in relationship with a living God is the way that we're designed to be. I mean, look at scripture. What happens when we give God our yes? It may not make any sense to this world. may not make any sense to this world. But I can tell you, when we give God our yes, he makes arcs that float, seas that part. Giants fall at the flick of a stone, right? These are the stories. Fishermen get to walk on water. Chains of addiction might fall off. The oppressed are set free and death will lose its sting. That is what it looks like to live a life free from the things that entangle. So to all those that are willing to allow God to remove their roadblocks, we get to experience the true gospel of a life redeemed and a relationship renewed with God. A relationship with God restored. That is the good news. We have the ability to engage God through prayer. We have the Holy Spirit living with us. We have his word. We get to be encouraged by it. We get to come together as the body of Christ, his holy church, and share testimonies of what God is up to and what he's done. We get to encourage each other, right? God bless you. And we get to see what happens when God takes our obedience and uses it as fertilizer for his outcome. That's the get to gospel. See, all the gospel is not painlessness. The gospel is freedom. We get to be linked to a life free with God when we give him our obedience. Now, we all need to live free, but we don't always know how. It starts really simple. Jesus, I believe you. Jesus, I want you. Jesus, come into my life and eradicate the roadblocks that are there so that I don't have anything in your way. I give you my yes. That's it. 
That's it. So if anybody in this room has not done that yet, do that. I give you my yes. It could even be that simple. Jesus, I give you my yes. I'll leave you with this. And I'm going to pray. The same words that Jesus leaves his disciples after the Last Supper. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. And they stepped out of the upper room into the rest of the world. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Let me pray for you all. Father God, thank you for the men and women at Trinity Church. Thank you for the men and women that are here in your presence, sitting in these pews, and those that are at home watching, those that aren't able to be here. God, I thank you for this amazing group of people. God, I pray freedom over them right now. I pray peace over them right now. That they would have peace knowing that you are a God who wants a relationship intimate with them, close to them, walk in lockstep with them, God. And I pray that each and every person in this room experiences a gift that is a life to the full that you promised not the prosperity gospel. God, if it's your will to give them prosperity, do it, use it for your good. But God, I ask that you would give them prosperity in a different way. Prosperity in the way that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are with them in everything that they do, that they would have peace that transcends understanding and that they would know you completely. That they would get the freedom to know what it looks like to live their lives with arms outstretched, saying, you have my everything, you have my all, you have my yes. Tell me to come and I will come. So, Lord, I pray that over my brothers and sisters here. Go with them in peace, God. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.